Yes. Hi, uh, I'm Beverly Gage. I teach in the history department here. Um, and I wanted to make just a quick, I was the one who John said had assigned witness for many years. Um, and I just wanted to make a, a quick observation about witness again and then also pose a question. So the observation is that I think, um, for those of you who haven't read it, witness is, it's a really fascinating book. And I think people tend to think that what's fascinating about it is its indictment of communism. Um, but it's also actually a fascinating account of conversion to communism. And, and about half of the book is actually about his very early experiences and experiences in the 1930s about why, in fact, he became a communist. And I think that that's not uh, always as uh, obvious about the book, but is very important about it as a historical document, as a primary source. Um, so my question, I happen to be writing about J. Edgar Hoover at the moment. My question is really for uh, Stanton Evans, which is to say that he is a figure who I think has um, gone down in history as having not a particularly great reputation in kind of the public consciousness in terms of uh, at least some of the roles that he played during the the late 40s, the early 50s, um, in terms of the battle against McCarthyism. And I'm just wondering uh, how you see Hoover's role in all of this, both in terms of your own research, his relationship uh, with Chambers, um, with, with Bentley and other figures, but sort of where you come down about, about J. Edgar Hoover. I am a great J. Edgar Hoover fan. Uh, I spent untold hours at the FBI going through the archives there, I have in my possession over 100,000 pages of FBI files, which I got legally through Freedom of Information. I, <laughs> and FBI agents in the room. Elizabeth Bentley, by the way, when she went to the FBI, did it here in New Haven. This is where she went to the FBI, right here. Uh, and um, she was the other uh, major witness against all these um, suspects. Hoover was a stalwart patriot, no question about it. He was meticulous in record keeping. I don't know, did you see, anybody here see that movie that came out, which the marvel of casting Leonardo DiCaprio as <laughs> J. Edgar Hoover, whoever came up with that. Um, I would have preferred Brad Pitt, frankly, for that role, but, <laughs> but, <laughs> In any event, a movie is a pastiche of falsehoods, but most of what we are given as alleged history, all present company accepted, uh, is that. I'm reminded of what Mary McCarthy uh, said about Lillian Hellman. Every word she writes is a lie, <laughs> including and and the. <laughs> uh, and that's my view, jaundiced view, of what is out there about Hoover. I think he's been smeared for the same reasons that Chambers was smeared. Finally, Hoover himself was very skeptical of Chambers. These, uh, these FBI guys didn't just accept anybody and anything telling them stuff. They didn't accept Bentley. They spent a lot of time backtracking, uh, checking, I might say, um, invasively checking up on people through wiretaps, of which there are many in the FBI files, transcripts. I say, once you've read raw, wiretaps, you never <coughs> want to go back. That's what, that's the real stuff. Uh, this is un, unedited, it's the, 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 the real thing. And what they did over and over again was to find out who was telling the truth. And they finally determined that Chambers was the one telling the truth, long before the case became public. Professor Gaddis, you wanted to say something? It's really a question that I want to raise. Um, and it's something that puzzled me in um, reading Witness. It's something that has puzzled me in thinking through the new literature that has come out on all of these issues. And this is the invisibility, uh, relative invisibility at least, of Henry Agard Wallace. Um, this is, uh, it seems to me, a really interesting uh, situation because there is Soviet documentation uh, uh, indicating fairly strongly that Wallace was regularly reporting to the Kremlin, certainly in 1945 and 46, when still in the Truman administration cabinet at this point as Secretary of Commerce. But also one thing that I came up with with regard to the 1948 campaign is the frustration of a secret effort that Kennan and General Marshall had made to at least approach the Soviets about uh, the possibility of negotiation, and that was blown uh, wide open 
in a way that strongly suggests contact between Wallace and the Kremlin at the time that Wallace was running on the progressive party ticket for president, third party ticket for president. So as I asked myself, uh, you know, who is the real hero in this story, uh, in this whole history? It's someone who has gotten a bad rap so far in the whole Whitaker Chambers, uh, Alger Hughes case, and somebody who really got a bad rap from George F. Kennan. But it is the President of the United States, Franklin D. Roosevelt, who for whatever reason, and we may never know the reason, dumped Wallace from the ticket in 1944 and sent him on an inspection trip to Siberia. <laughs> where he confused gulags with collective farms. <laughs> now, if you want to play the counterfactual game, and someone should write, I think, a Philip Roth counterfactual novel, change just one thing. Truman, uh, Roosevelt does not dump Wallace from the ticket in 44, and then Wallace becomes president of the United States at the time that all of this uh, stuff is breaking loose. What would have happened at that point. Why don't more people talk about this? <laughs> we have time for one more question. I'm going to use my prerogative and, and see if I can engage Lee maybe with this question. In uh, the famous uh, letter to my children, the foreword to the book uh, Witness, uh, Chambers writes the following, quote, it's on page 16. Communism is what happens when in the name of mind, he capitalizes mind, men free themselves from God a little bit, uh, a little bit below that. Um, there has never been a society or a nation without God, but history is cluttered with the wreckage of nations that became indifferent to God and died. Then he says, sums up, the crisis of the Western world exists to the degree in which it is indifferent to God, it exists to the degree in which the Western world actually shares communism's materialist vision. So I, I guess I'd like to ask more about Whitaker Chambers' materialism. What, um, from, uh, from, from our three uh, experts, panelists here, what is Whitaker Chambers' materialism? How did he understand materialism? And did he see liberalism as well as communism sharing that same, um, disease. It just seems to me that if you listen to that particular quote, you can see why Bill Buckley was so attracted and drawn to, uh, to Whitaker Chambers. And you can see why he was inspired and so anxious, uh, really anxious, to enroll Whitaker Chambers as a member of the editorial board of National Review when he was forming it, wanted desperately to have uh, Chambers on board. And if you begin to think about what can draw together people, and that's what I'm particularly uh, interested in, uh, written about, and talked about, and uh, referred to here, is bringing together the various strains of conservatism, uh, the, the conservatives, traditional conservatives, the libertarians, and others. What could do that? What could bring them together? I think at one level, it certainly was the, the, the realization that communism and this, as personified by the Soviet Union, was a clear and present danger, and that Bill reached out to traditionalists like Russell Kirk, to libertarians like Frank Meyer, and said, please, let's come together, uh, and let's form this magazine, and let's form this movement. That was also part of what he was trying to do. I think at the same time uh, that uh, if you look at uh, Ritiker Chambers' life, I think that he was very indifferent to materialism. I mean, it did not really matter to him at all. And you can see that life, that there are all kinds of things which, for example, after writing Witness, there were book contracts which he was offered. He could have made an extraordinary amount of money writing a, a, you know, a sequel, a follow-up, any other book or number of books about it. But he had said what had to be said, and he decided to retire uh, to the farm there in Westminster in the, in the western shore of, of Maryland. So I don't think he was a materialist at all, and certainly that would not have interested uh, Bill Buckley at all either, and it would not have interested, I think, uh, uh, the conservative movement at that time, confronted as it was by this uh, danger, which became so clear to them in the, in the Soviet Union and in communism. 